Our speaker tonight is truly on the front lines of conservation. He's working to save one of the most iconic and beautiful animals the world has ever known. I think we can agree that the beauty and charisma of the tiger is unmatched in our natural world. He works to conserve tigers in the Russian Far East, where logging, poaching, and human encroachment is threatening a dwindling wild population. He's been traveling to Russia since he was 15 and working on tiger conservation since 2002. He's also one of the foremost experts on one of the world's largest owls, the endangered Blackiston's fish owl, found in Northeast Asia, as well as the elusive Amur leopard. He and his team at the Wildlife Conservation Society are working tirelessly to close logging roads which serve as an easy entrance into the forest for poachers and hunters. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jonathan Slatt. Thank you. Is the, this is fine, the mic? Okay. Um, so uh, this is my, my second time at the Blank Park Zoo. I was here in July for a conference that they hosted, and it was fantastic, and it's, it's nice to be back. Um, so as, as Jesse alluded to, I, I have been going to Russia, especially the Russian Far East, for, for a number of years. And I've done a, a number of eclectic things uh, in, in that time. Um, I've, I've been involved in, in bear captures. I've examined whale carcasses. I've done uh, surveys for salmon in streams, and I once endured a 22-hour boat ride with drunken Russian loggers. <laughs> so so I, I've been exposed to a lot of different wildlife. Um, uh, but, but having said that, it's, it's birds, in particular owls, that, that, are, that are my thing. Um, all my graduate research was owls. All my free time when I'm in, in Russia, I'm out looking, looking for, for, uh, for birds. But I've, I've learned over the years that it's impossible to be involved in conservation in the southern Russian Far East without somehow being involved with tigers. Um, oh, uh, I've assumed a role in tiger conservation almost like osmosis. Um, I've, I've uh, searched for them in helicopters and biplanes. I've done uh, prey analysis studies. Uh, I've taken part in, in captures. And I've tracked them in, in winter um, in the snow. Um, so even though it wasn't on purpose, uh, over the years I've amassed a wealth of information about tigers, and that's, that's what I'm talking about to you tonight. Uh, so I'm going to briefly describe what the Wildlife Conservation Society is. I'm not sure if anyone knows who we are. I'll then spend a little bit of time talking about the province Primoria. This is where most um, wild and more tigers are. It's a, it's a wonderful country. Then I'll briefly describe the current status of tigers, focusing mostly on Russia, but also globally. And then I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about how uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society is working to, to save these tigers. So uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, was founded in 1895. Uh, it was then called the New York Zoological Society. It is still based in New York. They run all of New York City zoos. And their mission is to save wildlife and wild places across the globe. Currently have more than 500 conservation projects in more than 60 countries. And the uh, WCS has been in Russia since 1992. So Primoria is the southernmost province in the Russian Far East. Um, and uh, note that Siberia is in the middle of the country. Everything east of that is the Russian Far East. So it's one of the reasons that the word Amur is preferred to Siberian tiger, because there really aren't any tigers in, in Siberia. So uh, Primoria is bordered by China, North Korea, and the Sea of Japan. It's about twice the size of Iowa. The capital city is Vladivostok. There's about a million people living there. Uh, in the province, there's about two million people. So there are a few uh, cities smaller than Vladivostok, but most of the province is dotted with small villages like this of just a couple hundred people in single-story buildings. The majority of the province is mountainous. It's the, the Sikhateolin Mountains that run up the entire, the entire province. And it's, it's, it's really a beautiful country. They're low, undulating hills, rivers, uh, lush forests and some pretty spectacular coastline. Uh, the word Primoria means along the sea. And so the, the identity of the province is really closely tied to, to the ocean. There's one weird little spot of Primoria right around Lake Hantka that's, that's, that's lowlands. Um, it's been referred to as a sea of grass. There's a lot of agriculture there. But the rest of the province is mountainous. And the reason that Primoria is interesting to people like, like you and me is it has tremendous wildlife diversity. 
There's a, a line I like from a 94 paper that says, the unique vertebrate assemblage of Primoria challenges orthodox biogeography. And what that means is that the animals living there that don't follow regular patterns of species distribution. And, and what, it's, it's strange, it's a, it's a, it's a temperate forest. There's, there's oak, there's pine, there's maple, but it's heavily invaded from the north by the boreal ecosystem and heavily from the south by the subtropics. And they all kind of swirl together. So for example, that, that's why there are tigers here. These are, you know, it's a subtropical species that you associate with places like India and animals like leopards. Um, that you know, they're leopards in Africa, but they just extend their distributions up into Russia. And so these subtropical species are sharing forests with northern species like lynx and like brown bears. In fact, Primor is the only place in the world where brown bears and tigers share the same forests. They, they do interact and they do sometimes kill each other. So I'm just going to go over a couple of the other animals uh, that are interesting in the region. This is the other bear species. This is the Asiatic black bear. Again, a very uh, a species very much associated with, with the, uh, the subtropics. This is a raccoon dog. It's a, a, it's a true dog. It's a member of, of the dog family. And it's the only member of the dog family that hibernates in winter. The, the ones that live in Thailand don't, but the ones that live all the way up in Russia, they do. There's a lot of different deer, a lot of different ungulate species. There's, uh, there's sika deer, there's red deer, there's these little guys, roe deer, uh, and there, there's moose. It's the, the smallest moose subspecies in the world. Uh, in addition to being tiny, they also have a different, uh, different antler structure. So here's a moose from, from northern Minnesota, how you would expect their antlers to be. And this is what they look like in, in the southern Russian Far East, more like an elk or, or a deer. There's goral. These are odd goat-like animals. And this, this is their habitat. There's, there's thought to be about 1,000, 1,200 of these in the wild, the vast majority of which live along the coast, live on the coastal cliffs um, in Primoria. The wild boar, the, the preferred uh, prey species of tigers, the largest wild boar subspecies is, is there. There's musk deer. If you've never seen a musk deer, I mean, instead of antlers, males have fangs. They have, they have extended canines that come down. And here, here's a female. F females do not. And these are tiny little deer. I mean, th that's a normal-sized human being uh, putting a collar <laughs> on. A, it's albeit it's it's a it's a young musk deer, but nonetheless, I mean they're they're very they're very small and they look more like kangaroos than, than deer. Uh, this is the last mammal slide I'll show. This is a yellow-throated martin, another one of these very uh, subtropical uh, species that just ex reaches up into Russia, and these are. One of my favorite animals, uh, one of the reasons is that they're the primary predator of musk deer in winter. They hunt them down in packs. And, and don't get me started on the birds. Uh, the bird diversity there is just is out of this world. Okay. So uh, this, this section, I'm going to warn you, it's a little bit of a downer, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's OK. Uh, so the peach here is the historical range of tigers and the red is the current distribution. Just in the past 100 years, four subspecies have gone extinct, and there are, there are five that remain. It was thought that 100 years ago, there were 100,000 tigers in the wild, and that has dropped to about 3,500 in the wild today. So that's a 96.5% a population decline in only 100 years. And that's, that's pretty staggering. And so the, the question is, like, how, how could that have happened? I, I can't speak globally. I can, I can speak for Russia. At about that time, right, about 1900, it was estimated that 50 to 60 tigers were removed from the wild every year. Um, adults were typically hunted, um, and the young animals were caught live and sent to, to circus markets and zoo markets. And the way that the, the young ones were caught was, in winter, if, if a hunter would find tracks of a female with a couple of cubs, they would follow them as, as far as they could and then make a lot of noise. They'd shoot off their guns, and the tigers would scatter. And so then they'd chase down uh, the younger ones, who are much easier to catch than an adult. And they'd catch them with forked sticks and kind of pin them down and, and then put them in a sack. Uh, and so what, so what that means is if the, the, the adult breeders were being killed and the young animals who should be joining the breeding population are being removed, there's no breeders. There's no population growth. And that's so just, just plummeted. And this resulted in 20 to 30 or more tigers left in the wild by 1940. So they were this close to going extinct. Then, in 1940, 
the population started to recover. And this, is, this has never been demonstrated in another tiger range state that tigers have been able to recover their populations. And, the, and what happened in 1940, a young biologist figured out that there were very few tigers left. He petitioned the government to stop, uh, to, to stop hunting and to stop collecting for, for zoos and for circuses. And um, so there's been a, a dramatic slow recovery since then. And so currently there's thought to be about uh, 350 tigers in the wild. And that, that little that little dip at the end um, is largely due to some government restructuring from 2005 to 2010 that basically stopped uh, a lot of protection for tigers. And that's, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss later how, how we're uh, working on that. Um, so in addition to the law preventing hunting, you know, so what, what, what else is at play here? How, how, did they, how did they rebound? So I'm going to compare uh, Primoria here with Karnataka uh, in, in South, South India. And you can see that in both places, uh, that the dark red is a contracted part of the peach. But Primoria is still intact. It's one large population, whereas in southern India, it's, it's fragmented. And so this is, this is Karnataka. There's, there's, there's a lot of tigers down there, but a lot of it is no longer tiger habitat. It's, it's agriculture. And tigers are relegated to reserves. And, and this is Primoria. I mean, it's uh, the oak pine forest it brings in the ungulates, and uh, it's, it's excellent tiger habitat. And so even though when the numbers, they only got to 20 or 30, when the popula population was protected, there was space for them to then um, build their populations again. And human population density doesn't hurt. I mean, there's 319 people per square kilometer in Karnataka and 11.9 in Primoria. Uh, the province that I'm, uh, the county I mostly work in, there's 1.2 people per square kilometer. And compared to Iowa, there's 21. <laughs> so it was laws and existing habitat was able to help get tigers back onto their feet. So if, there, if there's so much space, in, if so much intact tiger habitat in, in, in Russia, in Primoria, why aren't there a, an absolute ton of tigers there? Why are there only 350? So some reserves, some single reserves in India have up to 150 tigers. Why, why isn't this true? in Russia. So this, this map here shows uh, home ranges of five different um, female tigers from some of our earlier research. And if you focus just on, on Olga up there, um, that, that's about 150 square miles. And that little red dot is a territory size of a female tigress, a Bengal tigress in Nepal. So Bengal tigers need 20 times less space to lead happy tiger lives than tigers do in Russia. And males in Russia have up to 500 square miles. And, and this is why, it's, it's, it's prey. Uh, here's, here's two cheetal in India leading happy lives, and here's, here's two roe deer being, being miserable in, in Primoria. <laughs> and w winters can be tough. There's, there's high uh, winter mortality um, trying to just, just make it through the winter. And so as a result, the, the, the tiger densities cannot, simply cannot naturally be very high. So whereas in India, reserves can house and protect large numbers of tigers, that's not true in Russia. Um, that's the outline of, of, a, of a fairly large reserve. It's a 1,500 square kilometer reserve. And you can see there's not a single tiger. And these are females. So they have much smaller territories than males. Not a single one is completely uh, inside the reserve. And so, so what that means is that most tigers live outside reserves in Russia. And so um, a kind of a guiding strategy for WCS conservation is to, yes, to focus on reserves, but also look at conservation issues across the, the, uh, the landscape. So the first thing that WCS does and, and uh, does well is, is, is biological monitoring. Um, when the project first started in 1992, uh, animals were, were captured and given radio collars, uh, more recently G uh, GPS collars, and the fates of these animals were tracked uh, just to get a sense of how much space they need, um, uh, et, et cetera. And pr prior to this, this partnership, with its, uh, we were working with, uh, with reserves to do this, Tigers are only ever tracked in winter. And you can see why by that picture, because you actually see where they're going in winter. You can't see where they're going other, other times of year. Uh, so all of our knowledge about tiger ecology was only, was really limited just, just to winter. And it is tremendously labor intensive to collect data uh, uh, in winter. Uh, this, this picture here shows two um, um, kind of the godfathers of, of Russian tiger conservation, these two here. 
that's, that's my, my boss in the middle. Uh, the, the short fellow uh, on the right uh, is Igor Nikolaev. He's one of the authors of, the, of that book I just showed. Um, in the early 1970s, he walked hundreds of kilometers in the snow to glean behavioral information. Uh, sometimes he tried to stay in cabins as much as he could at night, but sometimes he'd be stuck out there. And it gets down to minus 40 um, in, in, this, in this part of the world. So when he realized, okay, it's getting dark, I can't make it to the cabin, he would collect as much firewood as he could, start a fire, and he told me that he would just spend the whole night just flipping over because one side of his body would be freezing, the other side would be burning. And he, he did, that, did that to stay alive. And then wake up and keep tracking the tiger in, in the morning. Uh, this other fellow is, uh, is Dmitry Pikunov. Um, in the late 70s, he was interested in learning how many, how many prey tigers actually need to survive, so he also followed them. Uh, and he would go out for weeks at a time, again, in winter, on purpose, and, tr and track these cats and see what they were killing. And he survived by scavenging tiger kills. So, I mean, th these guys are clearly maniacs, but, there, but there's, no, there's, no, <laughs> there's no other way, there was no other way to get that information. And then suddenly, radio captures and radio telemetry. You, just, you, you catch, you catch a, a tiger, you put a collar on it, and you follow it remotely. Uh, and it's much easier than, than trudging through the snow. And this is an example of the information. This is from a GPS collar. Um, so you get a sense of, of home range, uh, what, what types of habitat they're using. And you can even tell there's certain spots, like there, and there, and there, where there's, there's a number of, of locations. And that's where, that's where likely the cat made a kill. And so once the, the animals moved away from that area, well, because they, they spend a couple of days at the same site, um, and then you can go in and see what it was that it killed and get a sense of uh, biomass and, and how much prey uh, these, these animals need, not just in winter, but, but year round. So it's, it's tremendously valuable information. Uh, a few years ago, the Russian government issued a moratorium on capture for science. So unfortunately, we, uh, we, we still do this to some degree, but not, not as much as, as we'd like. Um, a lot of our monitoring has now turned to, uh, to camera trapping. And it's the same general information about figuring out which, an which animals live where, but obviously it's not as valuable as the more fine scale uh, details. But it's a, it's a very cost effective way to understand which, which animals are where. But so the, the question is, you know, wh where do you put a camera trap? If you have these animals, if you have a male with a 500 square mile range and, and a female with 150, you know, how, how do you know where, the, where they're going to be? And c conveniently, tigers are highly territorial, and, and, and that's key. Um, they, they mark their territories the way um, dogs do fire hydrants, and, and my friend's cats like to do in my shoes. <laughs> uh, and so a, uh, you know, other tigers will come by, and they'll, they'll sniff the tree, and they'll know if a territory is occupied. They'll know if it's sa the same animal that was there before. And if, if, uh, if a male is, is sniffing a female tree, he'll know if she's ready to mate and if he, sh if he should pursue her or not. And it's, it's not, just, not just tigers, you know, cu cu curious humans smell the trees, uh, uh, red deer smell these trees, uh, bears smell these trees. There's just these landmarks, everything that walks by uh, sniffs these trees. And there, there's one, what the common theme for what, what is being marked is it's something different, something noticeable on the landscape. You know, it's a giant tree or it's, it's a, a burned tree in the middle of a, of a relatively open field. It's a giant rock on the beach. And, most particularly, a tree that leans. And you know, after, after a while, you're, you're just walking through the woods, and you can see, oh, you know, if there's a tiger here, I bet they, they, they mark that. You can walk over and, and sniff it. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, and sometimes you found a good spot to put up a camera. Uh, so here's a, a good example of a, of, a, of a leaning tree. And you can see the researcher in the corner setting up the camera trap. Uh, ridges are very popular. They like to walk along the ridges. Um, and there's a, it's a little bit more of a, of a science than you, well, than you might think. Uh, you, you try to make all the camera trap pictures more or less the same. So if that's the direction of travel, you try to make it about 11 feet from where the animal is going to go and about a foot and a half off the ground. And sometimes it's, it's a little dicey getting that camera at that, at that right spot. And it's unfortunately difficult to tell, but this, this guy, Sasha, basically jumped off a cliff to get into the crown of that tree um, to, get it, to get it just right. And the reason for that is we want to have these very clear images of the cat from, from both sides. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is that, you know, just like human fingerprints, you can identify uh, individual tigers based on their, on their stripe pattern. And yet, you, you can do it by eye. It's, it's, it's easy enough to do it by eye. But once you amass a large enough data set, um, there are, there's, a, there's a program that, that, that helps with this. And it's, it's quite, quite useful. And so we want the, these, these clear views. 
Uh, and WCS has developed a standardized camera trap methodology that's currently used in six of the eight protected areas in Russia that, that have tigers. And we, we manage the camera trapping in, in two of these reserves. This is, uh, this is one of them in, uh, way down in the, in the corner of, uh, of, of Primoria. So all this is China over here. Uh, North Korea is just a little bit further down, down there. And as you can see, I mean, pretty, and the, the red dots are over their cameras, the whole area is pretty well covered. So we have a pretty good idea about the exact numbers of tigers in this area. And we, uh, we manage uh, the, the WCS core area in the northern section. And we have other uh, NGOs uh, work in the other areas. And we just got permission to work inside the border zone with, with China. And WCS has a China program on the, uh, on, right on the other side. So we're starting to share information. And they're using the same methodology of starting to share information and learning which animals are, are moving across the border. And that's, that's really important for international conservation agreements, you know, proving that the same animals are using both sides of the border. So you know, we, uh, we, we, this camera trapping lets us know if the same animals are using the same territory year in, year out. Uh, they should be. Um, if they're not, if we're getting high turnover, there's something wrong. Uh, maybe there's poaching. Maybe there's disease. Uh, it gives us information on, on reproduction. Um, we were pretty sure this female had at least one cub, but we didn't didn't know for months until we, until we got this photo. Uh, it turns out there, uh, there, there had been three. Uh, this is the same ones uh, seven months later. They're, they're just down to two now, but they're, um, this was just taken uh, just December 21st, so they're, they're still out. Um, sometimes you just get ridiculously cute photos. <laughs> and interesting behavior. This is you know, uh, walking by with a kill. And uh, we're able to use this in legal cases now. Uh, tiger skins that have been confiscated at the border can now be traced back to specific places and specific times. So um, we can, if someone is caught with a tiger skin and they say, oh, you know, this was in my grandfather's attic for 20 years, well, we have a picture of this same animal six months prior in a reserve. And so that's, that's useful. And sometimes really weird things get caught. This is a, um, um, this is a, a golden eagle that's attacking and killing a young, a young deer. Okay. Um, so Anti-poaching is something that we've been really involved in uh, since, um, uh, since the, 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 um, the issues with, with funding in the Russian government that led to the, to the population decrease um, in, after 2005. Um, and it's, it's important to, to understand that during, under the Soviet Union, you know, um, poaching was highly controlled. Uh, the borders were closed. The export to the Asian market was difficult. And there were severe fines. I mean, people would go to jail for, for poaching. And so when that moratorium came in 1940, everybody stopped. Um, and that's, that's no longer true. The, uh, the borders are porous. There are many more border, uh, uh, border checkpoints. It's easier to get things across the border. And until, until this year, fines have been laughably minimal and, and poorly enforced. But that's, that's just starting to change, and I'll mention that later. Um, so as, as I've been mentioning, there was a, uh, the system for, protec for protection stopped functioning after, uh, in, in, this, in this time period. Uh, there were a lot of different government restructurings. It wasn't clear who was responsible for what. And, um, and, and uh, reserves stopped being funded. Um, the old guys, the guys who were reserve inspectors in the Soviet Union, who took real pride in their work, they were all retiring and being replaced by people who really couldn't get work elsewhere. I mean, they, they weren't being paid for months at a time. So low morale and just a really high turnover. And uh, one of the problems that wasn't a problem in the Soviet Union, I mean, you get paid if you patrolled or not. You know, in the Soviet Union, people liked what they were doing. They were out patrolling. They were out you know, prote protecting uh, the reserves. And that, that, that's, people weren't doing that anymore. Uh, you can you know, sit in the warm cabin in the middle of winter uh, with, a, with a book next to the wood stove, or you can be out trudging through the snow looking for poachers. So people, a lot of people were just not, not patrolling. So the result was year-round rampant poaching in these reserves. And this, this led to a pr proliferation of, of the game meat trade, and there were a lot of, um, the, the deer population was really hammered by this, and that, of course, uh, impacts, impacts tigers. So um, WCS, over, 
it, over the 20 years that we've been in Russia, we've captured and collared uh, more than 50 tigers. And um, so while uh, it's tough to say how poaching is impacting the population of tigers, we can speak about these 50. And we have recorded some natural mortality. This is a tiger who died when a, when a tree fell on his head in a storm. Uh, an, another tiger uh, fell through the ice in winter and drowned. But 75% of known deaths were due either 100% to poaching or very much to suspected poaching. Uh, this, this is a remains of a tiger that was caught in a snare that nobody ever bothered to check. So she, uh, she starved and, and decomposed there. So uh, in 2010, uh, we, uh, WCS, along with uh, several partners, some Russian and some, some international, uh, started working at, at two reserves. Um, that's moved, moved up to four in 2011. Uh, we're at five now, and we're starting to talk with, with, uh, with two more. And what, what, what we're doing is we're making sure inspectors are interested in what they're doing. We're making sure they're funded. We're making sure they're engaged. Uh, we're training them in, in, in methods. We're making sure they have equipment, getting them gas for their trucks. And we've in, uh, initiated a bonus system that's, that's pretty ingenious. Uh, I'll, I'll show you more in the next slide. And it's at the point now where the, ministry, the Russian Ministry of Natural Resources is really interested in this model. Like, sh uh, we've demonstrated a very fast turnaround in level of protection. And they're looking at it for other, other reserves out, outside of Tiger Range. So this is an example of, of the bonus system. Uh, so every month, uh, a reserve gets $1,500 to split among its, its, it, the teams of inspectors. Um, and it's, uh, it's split up based on points. So as you can see, uh, for the, the, first, the first two months, there were two teams. They, the orange team was, they're, they're great. They're out there. They're, they're patrolling. They're doing everything they need to be doing. Blue team is pretty good, too. The green team, these are the guys sitting in the cabin reading books. They're not doing anything the first couple months. And suddenly, they're realizing, they're seeing, the first two months, their buddies are getting an extra couple hundred dollars to take home, and they're not getting anything. So it's gotten to the point where they're like, yeah, they started more interested, more interested, and it got to the point by May, so just a couple months later, that output is basically even. So instead of po the poachers knowing that they could go to where the KP team patrols, because no one's ever going to be there, there's now even coverage over the reserve, which reduces uh, interest in poaching. So this just, this just shows the numbers improving of, of different metrics over time. Uh, and also, as of this year, the laws have finally become more strict. Uh, possession of wild parts is now a felony. It used to be a misdemeanor. You could, someone could find uh, two barrels of, of tiger skins in your closet, and you could say that you found them the day before next to the road, and you'd get a small fine, and that's it. And now it's now it's serious. Uh, possession is, is, is a felony. You can get jail time and, uh, and, um, and very large fines. So thing, things are turning a corner. They were ugly for a couple years, but things are starting to look a lot better. Uh, so uh, another anti-poaching approach is closing unused logging roads. And this, this is a project that I'm, I'm heavily involved in. So logging in the province is, is selective, so they're, they're not, they're not clear-cutting. And in, in, in some cases, selective logging is actually good for wildlife because it opens up the forest, it promotes growth, that brings in the deer, and that brings in the tigers. It's, uh, po uh, logging is also the backbone of the economy in Primoria. And you know, um, a poor economy is often a driving force of poaching. So we, we don't want to stop poaching, uh, logging altogether. We just want to make it less damaging to tigers and their prey. Uh, and so it's really it's the logging roads that are the problem. When, when a company goes into log an area, they, they set up this network of roads, they finish logging, they leave, the road stays there. And that's a problem. Especially in winter when there's a lot of snow, deer like to use these, um, these, these, these roadways as uh, travel quarters. So if you have guys that look like this driving around and they see something like this right next to the road, you know, that animal is probably going to get shot. Spotlighting is a really big deal. A lot of people spotlight. They uh, drive around at night. Uh, one guy usually has the, the, the spotlight. Um, someone else is in the back with the rifle. Anytime there's eye shine, they, they, they take the shot. Um, it's, you know, it's not just uh, you know, deer and other animals that use these roads. You know, uh, uh, tigers do too, and, and tigers have eye shine. Um, and so these are just a couple examples from, from, from my camera traps that I set up looking for, looking for poachers. I mean, it's very, very active. I mean, there's, there's a guy in a minivan um, out there um, spotlighting. And so th this graph just shows how, uh, on, the, on the left, 
These are roadless areas, so basically all tigers survive in roadless areas. And uh, especially cubs really get hammered the second um, roads show up. So we're blocking them. Uh, we're working with a logging company to put giant piles of dirt across the roads, and that's, th that's taken care of, of, the, of, the, of the worst perpetrators. Sure, people still can get over there on foot, but the difference is one guy shooting a deer and hauling it out versus the guy in a truck taking, taking five or six. And human-tiger conflicts ha have become very important also in recent years uh, as a result of the, of the poaching. Uh, and I'm here, conflict is defined as any time a tiger is threatening uh, dog, livestock, or, or humans. Uh, and these uh, human-tiger conflicts are, are um, very, um, local villagers kind of base their opinions on tigers based on their interactions they have. So if tigers are coming and killing dogs, they're not gonna like tigers. If they know that people can come and help they might like tigers more. So a, a common recipe for a conflict is a, a young dispersing tiger. So an animal, 14, 18 months old, whole life been with his mother, mother's doing most of the killing, you know, off on its own, hunting for the first time. You know, suddenly it's winter, it's cold, things are hard to catch, and they come across a village. And a village, village is just full of these little, little village dogs. And you know, tigers, bless them, they cannot resist a village dog. Uh, village dogs are they're insanely easy to catch, and, and they're, they're, and I guess they're delicious. Uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a line from a book I like that's, uh, tigers hunt dogs with fastidious diligence. They cannot, cannot resist. So a young tiger finds a village like this and just keeps cashing in on the dog vending machine until, <laughs> until either it escalates or, or, or there's some kind of intervention. And that's really bad for public percep perception of tigers. So prior to, to WCS involvement, any conflict resulted in a tiger just being removed from the wild. So if someone looks out their window and there's a tiger eating their dog, they call the wildlife inspector, he comes over, he shoots the tiger, and that's it. Uh, since 1999, when WCS got involved in, in these conflicts, there's a decision tree. Um, so there are now three choices, one of which is just do nothing. You know, let, let, let it run its course. Uh, the tiger is probably get leaving. We don't need to do anything. Uh, translocating is a big deal. Now we do that, and room for the wild is still on the table. But captures to assess condition is, is a big part of that. And we have, a, we have a team of guys who are ready to, they can be almost anywhere in the province in a day or two to address some of these, some of these conflicts. So they'll, they'll go in, uh, see what the story is, kind of figure out what, what needs to be done. So if, uh, if a tiger's killed something like, uh, like a cow or a horse, it's probably gonna come back for a couple days. So sometimes they'll just set up trip wires uh, with fireworks and that'll, that'll scare the tiger off. And sometimes they need to, to dart it and, and catch it. And, kind of figure out why the tiger's acting the way it does. Okay, I'm gonna show a, this is, this is a short clip from a, um, a video that came out in the 90s called In the Shadow of the Tiger, which is worth seeing. So the tiger's been snared around the wrist, and, and the snare's on a spring. So the point there is to move in as quickly as possible, uh, dart the animal and move out to, 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 to reduce stress. So uh, WCS currently has the only team who has the, the expertise to, to lead these, these situations. And so once the, once the animal is, um, is, um, is, is knocked out, uh, to do a physical assessment, see if there's any physical reason why the animal maybe can't catch wild prey. Uh, maybe that's why it's hunting dogs, because it has a, a broken foot or something. Um, but uh, in many cases, they're just, like I said, it's a young animal, it's, it's dispersing, and uh, just, you know, couldn't resist the dogs. Um, and in those cases, animals are given GPS collars. Um, they're taken somewhere remote, and they're, and they're let go. 
Um, and there, there, have now, there have been several dozen tigers have been given a second chance at life uh, because, of, because of these interventions. Uh, a, a very new thing that we, this is just the last couple of years that we've been involved in this. Um, a, a lot of different NGOs and government agencies in Russia have been involved in rehabilitating uh, tiger cubs. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a young female. She was found in the woods in, in, in December, almost dead. I mean, she was starving. Uh, she had lost half her tail to frostbite. And, and she was taken to a, to a facility that had, that had just been constructed um, a little bit north of Vladivostok. That's just, it's a large enclosure. Um, and they're, uh, they're kind of you know, put out there, they're monitored by, by remote camera, and they're fed first uh, just chunks of meat, and then it turns into live rabbits, and then boar, and then deer. So they're, they're in, this, in their space learning how to, how to be tigers kind of on, on their own time. Uh, and so this, this cat was, was nicknamed Zolushka, which is Cinderella in Russian because of her, her transformation. And so, uh, and so she was released. Um, so if, if you were to look at a map uh, of tiger distribution and you were to guess, make an educated guess where she was released, you would almost certainly be wrong. Uh, she was captured way down here. Uh, that center is about here. And she went there. She went to Bastak Reserve, which is outside of current range. There haven't been tigers seen in this area for decades. And then two years ago, they started seeing tracks of a single male. He had, he had uh, dispersed from, from current range over there. And so the idea was, if we release Zolishka there, and she breeds with this male, then we're, we're expanding tiger range. So here's, uh, here's the road to Bastak. And it's about 700 kilometer drive. It's, it's a pretty serious drive. And th this footage is from IFAW, one of our partners, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. You guys don't have these in the U.S.? Okay, and then next are just a couple uh, different angles of her release. So she's been doing great. Uh, she was released May of last year. Um, she's established a home range. Um, you know, she, she does have the GPS collar. So we have been going in and seeing what she's killing. She's, she's killing deer. She's killing boar. Uh, these are images from just, just last month. Um, you know, you can, again, you can see the short tail, so you, you know it's her. Um, and she's, she's really thriving. And she's interacted with the local male. She's a little young to breed. She's, um, she's just about two and a half. Uh, typically around three is when, when they breed in the wild. Um, but that she's a, she has this relationship with him. They've been traveling together. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic news. Um, and there's the, there are currently five cubs at, at this facility. Um, there, there was a documentary that came out fairly recently uh, by the BBC. And they happened to be there when, uh, when we went in to, uh, to, to capture these three cubs that had been orphaned. As I, I didn't mention that um, it's likely that, that the mothers of all, these, of all these cubs were poached. I mean, healthy tigers don't give birth. And, you know, healthy tigers don't abandon their cubs after, after three months. 
So it's, you know, we, again, we can't say for sure, but it's, poaching is, is likely the, uh, the culprit. So um, the last thing that's, that's important uh, that we're doing is working with younger, uh, next generation of, of tiger conservationists. Um, back to these guys. So uh, in the Soviet Union, scientists did very well. Uh, they were well funded, they were, they were respected, and this all, this all changed when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the situation was, was pretty dire. Uh, a colleague of mine, um, he was making $7 a month uh, in those years. So m a lot of people fled the field, and there, uh, no one was being recruited into it. And so there are very, very, very few Russians uh, in the field of conservation, in the field of tiger conservation, uh, ages 35 to 50. Like, that whole generation is gone. And so what we're doing is we've been working with Russian universities and institutes to recruit the next generation. Uh, people are work, working on a variety of different topics, mostly related to tigers, but, but, but not always. Um, we built a, a, a facility in Ternay um, uh, along the coast. This is a place where graduate students come and they study, they work on their various projects, they interact. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is Ternay. Uh, this is where I'm based out of when, when, I'm, when I'm in Russia. You can see the Sea of Japan away in the distance there, and that's kind of the town in the valley. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful facility. We have, we have training exercises, um, and we're, uh, we're starting to build um, a generation, again, of, of tiger conservationists. We've helped place graduates in uh, positions with conservation NGOs, uh, with research institutes, and with, with nature preserves. Um, so to date, we've had about 20 students go through this. It's an informal program, but about 20, uh, more than 20 students have gone through this. Most of them have stayed in conservation and many now play key decision roles in tiger conservation. So, uh, for example, uh, there are the two women are now the deputy directors for scientific programs at two different reserves. And that, that's, a, that's a senior position. I mean, they're dictating um, conservation research projects at these reserves. Uh, another woman is on reserve staff at, at, at Land of the Leopard Reserve down there. And another woman is on staff at Sekhote Alin. Sasha, who you've seen throughout this entire presentation, he runs all of our camera trap work uh, down in, in the southwest part of, part of Primoria, and he also leads all of our captures, uh, all of our human tiger conflict work throughout the province. We've worked with a wildlife veterinarian who now does work on uh, infectious disease. There was a um, canine distemper outbreak in 2009 that damaged the, the, the tiger population, and he's working um, to figure out uh, what uh, how, how serious a threat that is to, to come back again and what other diseases are out there. And two people work at uh, an institute in Vladivostok. One of them, the guy on the, the left there, is the head of the mammalogy lab. Again, about as senior as you can go um, in the system. So uh, I'm uh, winding down. Uh, so um, even for non-tiger range states. So places like the United States, we don't have tigers. I mean, tigers are important. Um, they're born ecologically, and they're globally important culturally. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, in Russia, they maintain an ecological balance by uh, keeping prey populations in check. And my, my, my boss, Dale McKell, in, um, it, it, um, it could have been tigers in the snow, I don't remember, what, 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 uh, tiger documented from the 90s. He summed it up eloquently by saying, T is for tiger. I mean, it's something that everybody knows. And um, know it's a symbol of wilderness, and knowing that there are tigers out there means we haven't screwed everything up. And it, it gives us hope. So uh, my last slide, uh, WCS Russia is certainly a leader in, in tiger conservation. We have the longest running tiger monitoring program anywhere. Uh, we currently guide anti-poaching strategies at five of, of the eight tiger you know, source sites, uh, which are important tiger reserves. We've released dozens of tiger back in the, tigers back into the wild, giving them a second chance at life. And we've trained more than 20 students to be leaders in more tiger conservation. And uh, zoos have been a really big part of, of that. We get a lot of our funding from zoos and from, from events like this. So uh, thank you. If, if there are questions, uh, we have we have time for questions. Yes.
Mostly no, and that's uh, that that's uh, above our pay grade. That that's a decision that the that the Russian government makes, and there there is a tiger right now that we have that situation at, at that um, rehabilitation center. Uh, there's a female who was um, I mean, she was she was killing dogs like crazy at this village, and went in. They captured her, and she was completely unafraid of humans, and that's a super bad sign. Uh, so they, we the assumption was that there was some she had some kind of disease. We, you know, we run blood tests, and she's perfectly healthy. Uh, we can't find any disease, and she's not remotely intimidated by humans. And that's just a recipe for uh, for disaster. So and it's not it's not clear. Uh, we're waiting for the Russian government to say what what's going to happen with her. Typically, they go to, to to zoos somewhere. Maybe. I mean the. Um, I forget the name of that subspecies, but whatever, there, there, you know, there was a tiger in, in that part of the world, and there was some genetic analysis that was done a couple years ago that suggested that it's, it's genetically identical to the Amur tiger, that it was just kind of the same, the same population. And there, have, there has been some talk about reintroducing tigers into sort of the Central Asia, the North Central Asia area. Um, I don't know enough about it. Uh, to say for sure. Um, a lot of tiger people think that's crazy to reintroduce the tigers there. But, yeah. Caspian, that's what it is. Uh, my my uh, father was a U.S. diplomat, and he was stationed in, uh, in Moscow. And I kind of on a whim went out to the Far East uh, and just was hooked. How's my Russian? Yeah, yeah my Russian's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, just, I've, just, I've been going there way too long for it not to be reasonable. Tiger. Tiger. It's pretty easy. Uh, I, I'm hoping to go back in, in August. Uh, I. The, the, the Russians banned me from their country for a year, which started last July. So I can reapply for a visa in, in August. So hopefully they'll let me back in. It, it hasn't yet, uh, but you know, who knows uh, what direction that's going to go. They don't say why. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah.